Welcome back to my channel. In this video, I will teach you all you need to know about the erythropoietin stimulating agents. This includes the physiology of erythropoietin, the mechanism of action, and the side effects of these medications. I hope you enjoy. Erythropoietin stimulating agents, also known as ESAs, are simply drugs that have the same mechanism and effect as erythropoietin, a naturally occurring hormone in the body. The name ESAs can be confusing and misleading because it sounds like these agents or drugs stimulate erythropoietin production. But no, when these drugs are taken, they actually go in the body and act like erythropoietin, also known as EPO. The majority of the EPO in your body is produced by the peritubular cells of the kidneys, but smaller amounts may also be produced by the liver, the bone marrow, spleen, lungs, and brain. Now, the production of EPO by the kidneys depends mainly on the amount of oxygen that's in the blood. Why is that? Well, it's because the job of EPO, after it's produced by the kidney, it goes to the bone marrow and stimulate the production of red blood cells. So in situations and conditions when your oxygen blood level are low, also known as hypoxia, the amount of EPO being made by the kidneys will increase, leading to more red blood cells to be made. And as we all know, red blood cells carry oxygen. So by increasing the red blood cell level during hypoxia, it's the body's compensatory mechanism to help increase the oxygen carrying capacity in the blood as more red blood cells can pick up oxygen and take it to the rest of the body. Now, without any significant hypoxia, the EPO normal ranges between 2.6 to 18.5 mu per milliliter. But in the presence of hypoxia, it can reach up to 1,000. So knowing this, the EPO levels can help with diagnosis of certain conditions. So on the left side, we have high EPO levels and conditions associated with it. And on the right side, we have low EPO levels and conditions associated with it. As mentioned already, high levels of EPO is seen in situations with decreased blood oxygen levels or when not enough oxygen is reaching certain parts of the body. These conditions include various types of anemia, so iron deficiency anemia, anemia due to thalassemia, and hemolytic anemia. In iron deficiency anemia, there's low iron. This will lead to low hemoglobin, which will lead to low red blood cell production. So the body compensates by amping up the EPO levels to go and tell the bone marrow, make red blood cells now. By the way, I have a video on iron deficiency anemia. Check it out, link right above. In thalassemia, there is a decrease of certain proteins required to make a full hemoglobin. Therefore, it leads to low hemoglobin and subsequently low red blood cell production. Very similar to iron deficiency anemia, the body compensates by amping up the EPO levels to go and tell the bone marrow, make red blood cells now. In hemolytic anemia, we have red blood cell destruction. So again, the body will try to fix this problem by increasing EPO to go and increase red blood cell production. Now on the right, we have conditions associated with low EPO. In chronic kidney disease, it is a progressive worsening kidney function, and patients usually present with decrease in the production of EPO. Anemia of chronic disease occurs in patients whom the current illness, usually cancer, infections, and other immune-mediated diseases. These conditions may elicit an active immune inflammatory response leading to reduced iron uptake, destruction of the precursor red blood cells, and decreased EPO production plus EPO receptors in the bone marrow. In polycythemia vera, it is a type of blood cancer. It causes your bone marrow to make too many red blood cells. These patients typically present with low EPO because you already have a lot of red blood cells. So the body would not release EPO for it to go and tell the bone marrow to make more red blood cells. The ESAs we have on the market are epoetin, which goes by the brand name Epigen and Procrit, and then Darby Poetin, 
also known as RNASP. These agents were developed using recombinant DNA technology, which allows you to take a gene of interest, so in this case, the EPO gene, insert this gene into a plasmid, which is a vehicle that can carry DNA. This is now known as recombinant DNA. This recombinant DNA is inserted into a non-virulent bacteria cell, and then we allow the cell to replicate and make more copies of this recombinant DNA. In general, there are no clinically significant differences in the safety and efficacy of epoetin and darbupoietin. Epoetin was first approved and then darbupoietin came along. And darbupoietin was marketed as having a longer half-life than epoetin, which translated to less frequent doses. These agents may be administered as subcutaneous or intravenous with similar efficacy and toxicity. Some studies have shown that subcutaneous epoetin has a longer half-life than the IV route. It is also able to achieve the target hemoglobin that we want at lower doses compared to when it's administered as IV. Less doses also translates to reduced cost and more money saved. The ESAs are FDA indicated for anemia due to CKD and anemia due to chemotherapy use. Now, aside from these FDA-approved indications, ESAs are utilized off-label to reduce the need for blood transfusions. ESAs and blood transfusions do the same thing, right? They increase the red blood cell. But ESAs are sometimes used as an alternative so we don't give the patient too much blood transfusions. Now, why would we not want to give a patient a lot of blood transfusions? What's wrong with it? Well, unfortunately, blood transfusions come with many side effects. I've listed some here for you, but even with the side effects out of the picture, blood transfusions have other limitations that may make them less favorable compared to the ESAs. One being in situations when the patient has to travel long distance to the hospital to get the blood transfusion. The other being patients who, because of their religious beliefs, they are restricted from getting blood transfusions. This is seen with Jehovah Witnesses. Okay, enough of making blood transfusions look so bad. <laughs> the ESAs aren't benign either. Let's start with the mild side effects. Headache. Swelling of the face and lower extremities, joint pain, simply because the ESAs go into the bone marrow and stimulate and increase the activity in there. Lastly, hypertension. ESAs can make the blood very viscous by causing the body to produce a lot of red blood cells. This thickening of the blood can increase the blood pressure and also put the patient at risk of blood clots. These blood clots can lead to a stroke. MI, DVT, or PE. Because of this, whenever a patient is being started on an ESA, always make sure that the patient doesn't have a history of clots, as this will obviously increase the risk of another clot while on the ESA. As the dose of the ESA increases, the risk of the blood clots also increases, and that's all we know. We don't know what specific dose will definitely lead to a clot. This is because ESA dosing and response is very individualized. So 40,000 units in patient A may be the perfect dose, but in patient B, it can lead to blood clots. So in clinical practice, what we do is we start the patient on the recommended initial dose, and then after that, we increase and decrease the dose based on the patient's hemoglobin level. The reason why we use the hemoglobin as a reference for dose adjustments in this case is because there is a correlation between high hemoglobin levels and increased risk of clots. ESAs increase red blood cell production, which comes with an increased hemoglobin. So hemoglobin serves as a good monitoring parameter. The package insert recommend to start the initial dose when the patient's hemoglobin is less than 10. I don't want to discuss the dosing in detail because it varies for epoetin and darbipoetin. So follow the package insert recommendation. But just to quickly give you an example of the recommended dosing for epoetin, in patients with CKD on dialysis, is usually 50 to 100 units per kilogram, IV or subcutaneous three times per week. In patients with chemotherapy-related anemia, it's 150 units per kilogram, IV or subcutaneous three times per week, or 40,000 units subcutaneous weekly. Anyways, let's just say that we have a patient who's been started on an initial dose of an ESA. After that is when the actual work begins, because now we have to titrate the dose to meet the recommended target hemoglobin. 
Unlike the dose of ESAs, which is individualized, researchers have been able to establish standard target hemoglobins for the ESAs for the two indications. These standard hemoglobin targets were analyzed in clinical trials, and they found that when we target these numbers, it helps manage the anemia, reduce the patient's need for blood transfusions, and lastly, reduce the risk of clots. For patients with anemia due to CKD, it is recommended to target a hemoglobin of less than 11. For anemia due to chemotherapy, most studies recommend to target a hemoglobin of less than 12. So we adjust these patients' doses to achieve the target hemoglobin. So if the hemoglobin increases above the target, then we can consider decreasing the dose or holding therapy. If the hemoglobin is not increasing despite multiple doses, then we can consider increasing the dose of the ESA. The rate of the hemoglobin increase is also important. So for example, if the hemoglobin increases by more than one in two weeks, even if it's below the target, you should consider reducing the dose by 25%. If the hemoglobin increases by less than one in two weeks, consider increasing the dose by 25%. Always refer to the package insert for clear and specific recommendations on how to dose adjust. As you can see, dosing of these agents is an art, and each patient's dose will depend on their condition, their weight, the hemoglobin response, the rate of the response, and other variabilities among patients. Also, I know these target hemoglobins are lower than the normal hemoglobin of adults, males, and females, but like I said, these are the numbers that have been shown to be efficacious with low toxicity in those disease states. Targeting a higher hemoglobin in these patients have been associated with increased mortality as well. Also, it is recommended to always use the lowest dose possible to reduce the need for blood transfusions. So we discussed clots as a precaution for using these drugs. Another major caution is using the ESAs in certain cancers. We know that ESAs do have an FDA indication to be used in cancer patients who experience anemia due to the chemotherapy, but there are still some caveats to this. So unfortunately, some researchers have found a decrease in the overall survival rate increase in the disease progression and reoccurrence when ESAs were used in patients with the following type of cancers. When these researchers came out with these results, it was a bit shocking because we initially thought that we knew exactly what erythropoiesis did in the body, right? Which is go to the bone marrow, stimulate the bone marrow so it can produce red blood cells. Simple. But wait, there is more. With further investigation, researchers actually found that erythropoietin had pleiotropic effects. When I say EPO, I'm obviously talking about ESAs, right? So ESAs go in the body and act like EPO. I digress. Pleiotropic effects, by definition, is when a substance has other effects other than the main effect it's known for. The substance can be a drug or even a hormone. In this case, it's the hormone erythropoietin. So it has effects other than stimulating the production of red blood cells, and it's due to high levels of EPO receptors being found on many different cell types. These pleiotropic effects may be the reason why ESAs lead to these negative outcomes listed above in certain cancers. Pleiotropic effects of erythropoietin include inducing cell proliferation or promoting cell division, which as we know will only make the tumor stronger, or more evil. They promote angiogenesis or formation of blood vessels, which can feed the tumor with nutrients and oxygen and other things to make it stronger or more evil. Lastly, inhibition of apoptosis. So now no cell death will occur, which only adds wood to the fire. Because of all that I've discussed so far, we have to take some extra precautions when we are using ESAs in cancer patients in order to prevent all the negative outcomes discussed previously. The manufacturer recommends the following, and these recommendations are for all cancer types, not just the ones that were found to have the negative outcomes when the ESA were used. ESAs are not indicated for patients receiving chemotherapy when the anticipated outcome is cured because of the negative outcomes listed above. Only use it in cancer patients as per the FDA indication. And lastly, discontinue the ESA once the patient completes the chemo. Again, ESAs are indicated for anemia due to chemotherapy, right? So if the chemo is completed, 
right, the thing that's causing the anemia, then we don't need the ESA. The next precaution of ESAs I would like to discuss is something known as pure red cell aplasia. This is a rare disorder that causes the bone marrow to stop producing red blood cells, leading to severe anemia. The pathophysiology is related to the body developing antibodies against the ESA that was administered. These antibodies neutralizes the ESA, preventing it from working. But unfortunately, the antibodies start neutralizing the body's own erythropoiesin as well. This ultimately leads to failure of the bone marrow to make red blood cells. In patients receiving ESAs, if severe anemia develops plus low red blood cell count, hold therapy and test for these antibodies. If it comes out positive, the ESA should be discontinued permanently and do not switch to another ESA. Pure red cell aplasia is very rare and may not be the cause of many cases where there is a lack or loss of response to the ESA, meaning the hemoglobin did not increase after several dose adjustments. This can simply be resistance to ESAs because of another causative factor. Things like inflammation, infections, bleeding, and more importantly, iron deficiency can all be causative factors. For all patients, evaluate the iron status before and during the ESA treatment and initiate iron supplement therapy as needed. And that will be the end of this video. I hope I was able to break down the ESA drug class in the simplest way for you to understand. If you learn at least one thing, I would appreciate it if you give this video a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave a comment. Thank you for watching this video and take care.